Hamlet, Act One, Scene One. Enter Bernardo and Francisco, two sentinels. Who's there? Nay, answer me. Stand and enfold yourself. Long live the king. Bernardo? He? You come most carefully upon your hour. Tis now struck twelve. Get thee to bed, Francisco. For this relief, much thanks. Tis bitter cold, and I am sick at heart. Have you had quiet guard? Not a mouse stirring. Well, good night. If you do meet Horatio and Marcellus, the rivals of my watch, bid them make haste. Enter Horatio and Marcellus. I think I hear them. Stand ho, who is there? Friends to this ground. And liegemen to the dying. Give you good night. Oh, farewell, honest. Who hath relieved you? Bernardo has my place. Give you good night. Francisco exits. Hello, Bernardo. Say, what? Is Horatio there? A piece of him. Welcome, Horatio. Welcome, good Marcellus. What? Has this thing appeared again tonight? I have seen nothing. Horatio says, tis but our fantasy. I will not let belief take hold of him, touching this dreadful sight twice seen of us. Therefore, I have entreated him along with us to watch the minutes of this night, that if again this apparition come, he may approve our eyes and speak to it. Tush, tush, twill not appear. Sit down a while, and let us once again assail your ears that are so fortified against our story what we have two nights seen. Well, sit we down, and let us hear Bernardo speak of this. Last night of all, when yon same star that's westward from the pole had made his course to lumine that part of heaven where now it burns, Marcellus and myself, the bell then beating one. Is it not like the king? Peace, break off. In the same figure, like the king that's dead. I have a problem. They've given me the pages in the wrong order. It's not like, yeah, I, I'll jump ahead. Peace, break the off. Okay. Question at Horatio. No. Yes. All right, I've got it. Okay. Enter ghost. Peace, break the off. Look where it comes again. In the same figure, like the king that's dead. Thou art a scholar, speak to it, Horatio. Looks he not like the king? Mark it, Horatio. Most like. It harrows me with fear and wonder. It would be spoke to. Question it, Horatio. What art thou that usurpest this time of night? together with that fair and warlike form in which the majesty of buried Denmark did sometimes march. By heaven, I charge thee, speak. It is offended. See, it stalks away. Stay, speak, speak, I charge thee, speak. Ghost exits. Tis gone, will not answer. How now, Horatio, you tremble and look pale. Is not this something more than fantasy? What think you want? Before my God, I might not this believe without the sensible and true avout of my true of mine own eyes. Is it not like the king? As thou art to thyself. Such was the very armor he had on when he when he, the ambitious Norway, combated. So frowned he once, when in an angry pile he smote the sledded pollocks on the ice. Tis strange. Thus twice before, and jump at this dread hour, with martial stalk hath he gone by our watch. In what particular thought to work I know not, but in the gross and scope of mine opinion, this bodes some strange eruption to our state. Good, now sit down and tell me that what he knows. Why 
the same strict and most observant watch so nightly toils the subject of the land. And why such daily cast of brazen cannon and foreign mark for implements of war? Why such impressive shipwrights whose sore task does not divide the Sunday from the week? What might be toward that this sweaty haste doth make the night joint labour with the day? Who is't that canst inform me? That can I. At least the whisper goes so. Our last king, whose image even but now appeared to us, was, as you know, by Fortinbras of Norway, thereto pricked on by a most emulate pride, dared to the combat in which our valiant Hamlet, far for so to this side of our known world esteemed him, did slay this Fortinbras, who by a sealed compact, well ratified by law and heraldry, did forfeit with his life all those his lands which he stood seized of to the conqueror against against the which a moiety competent was gauged by our king, which had returned to the inheritance of Fortinbras, had he been vanquisher, as by the same come out and carriage of the article designed. His fell to Hamlet. Now, Sir Young Fortinbras, of unimproved metal, hot and full, hath in the skirts of Norway here and there sharked up a list of lawless resolutes for food and diet to some enterprise that hath a stomach in it which is no other as, as it doth well appear unto our state, but to recover of us by strong hand and terms compulsory those foresaid lands so by his father lost. And this, I take it, is the main motive of our preparations, the source of this our watch, and the chief head of this post haste and rummage in the land. I think it be no other, but even so. Well may it sort that this portentous figure comes armed through our watch so like the king that was and is the question of these wars. The moat it is to trouble the mind's eye in the most high and palmy state of Rome, a little ere the mightiest Julius fell. The graves stood tenantless and the sheeted dead did squeak and gibber in the Roman streets as stars with trains of fire and dews of blood, disasters in the sun and the moist star upon whose influence Neptune's empire stands was sick almost to doomsday with eclipse and even the like precurse of feared events as harbingers preceding still the fates and prologue to the omen coming on have heaven and earth together demonstrated unto our climatures and countrymen. Enter ghost. But soft, behold, lo, where it comes again. I'll cross it, though it blast me. Say, illusion. It spreads its his arms. If thou hast any sound or use of voice, speak to me. If there be any good thing to be done that may to thee do ease and grace to me, speak to me. If thou art privy to thy country's fate, which happily for knowing may avoid, oh, speak. Or if thou hast abhorred in thy life extorted treasures in the womb of earth, for which they say you spirits oft walk in death, speak of it. Oh. Stay and speak. Stop it, Marcellus. Shall I strike at it with my partisan? Do, if it will not stand. Tis here. Tis here. Ghost exits. Tis gone. We do it wrong being so majestical to offer it the show of violence, for it is as the air invulnerable. Now vain blows malicious mockery. It was about to speak when the cock crew. And then it started like a guilty thing upon a fearful summons. I have heard that the cock that is the trumpet to the morn doth with his lofty and shrill sounding throat awake the god of day. And at his warning, whether in sea or fire, in earth or air, the extravagant and erring spirit hies to his confine and of the truth herein, this present object made probation. It faded on the crowing of the cock. Some say that ever gangs that season comes wherein our Saviour's birth is celebrated, 
This bird of dawning singeth all night long. And then they say no spirit dare stir abroad. The nights are wholesome. Then no planet strike. No fairy takes, no witch hath power to charm. So hallowed and so gracious is that time. So have I heard and do in part believe it. But look, the, mor the morn in russet mantle clad walks o'er the dew of yon high eastward hill. Break we our watch up and by my advice, let us impart what we have seen tonight unto young Hamlet. For upon my life, this spirit dumb to us will speak to him. Do you consent we shall acquaint him with it as needful in our loves fit, fitting our duty? Let's do it, I pray. And I this morning know where we shall find him most convenient. The exit, Hamlet, Act One, Scene Two. Flourish. Da, da, da. Enter Claudius, King of Denmark. Gertrude, the Queen. The Council, as Polonius and his son Laertes. Hamlet with others, among them Voltamand and Cornelius. Though yet of Hamlet, our dear brother's death, the memory be green, and that it is us befitted to bear our hearts in grief and our whole kingdom to be contracted in one brow of woe, yet so far hath discretion fought with nature that we with wisest sorrow think on him together with remembrance of ourselves. Therefore, our sometime sister, now our queen, the imperial jointress uh, to this warlike state, have we, as twere with a defeated joy, with an auspicious and a dropping eye, with mirth in funeral and with dirge in marriage, in equal scale weighing delight and dole taken to wife. Nor have we herein barred your better wisdoms, which have freely gone with this affair along, for all our thanks. Now follows that you know, young Fortinbras holding a weak supposal of our worth, or thinking by our late dear brother's death, our state to be disjoint and out of frame, colleagued with this dream of his advantage, he hath not failed to pester us with message, importing the surrender of those lands lost by his father with all bonds of law to our most valiant brother. So much for him now for ourselves, And for this time of meeting, thus much the business is. We have here writ to Norway, uncle of young Fortinbras, who impotent and bedrid, scarcely hears of this his nephew's purpose to suppress his further gate herein in that the levies, the lists and full proportions are all made out of his subject. And we here dispatch you, good Cornelius and you, Voltamand, for bearers of this greeting to old Norway, giving it to you no further personal power to business with the king, more than the scope of these dilated articles allow. <clears throat> Farewell, and let your haste commend your duty. Who is that? In that and all things, we'll, we show our duty. We doubt it nothing. Heartily farewell. Bolsamond and Cornelius exit. And now, Laertes, what's the news with you? You told us of some suit. What is it, Laertes? You cannot speak of reason to the Dane and lose your voice. What wouldst thou beg, Laertes? That, that, that shall not be my offer, not thy... That shall not be my offer, not thy asking. The head is not more native to the heart, the hand more instrumental to the mouth, than is the throne of Denmark to thy father. What wouldst thou have, Laertes? My dread lord, your leave and favour to return to France, from whence thou willingly I from whence though though willingly I came to Denmark to show my duty to your coronation, yet now I must confess that duty done, my thoughts and wishes bend again toward France 
and bow them to your gracious leave and pardon. Have you your father's leave? What says Polonius? Yes, my lord, wrung from me my slow leave by labor and petition, and at last, upon his will I sealed my heart consent. I do beseech you, give him leave to go. Take thy fair hour, Laertes. Time be thine, and thy best graces spend it as they will. But now, my cousin Hamlet and my son. A little more than kin and less than kind. How is it that the clouds still hang on you? Not so, my lord. I am too much in the sun. Good Hamlet, cast thy night at colour off, and let thine eye look like a friend on Denmark. Do not forever with thy veiled lids seek for thy noble father in the dust. Thou knowest tis common that all lives must die, passing through nature to eternity. Aye, madam, it is common. If it be, why seems it so particular with thee? Seems, madam? Nay, it is. I know not seems. Tis not alone my inky cloak, good mother, nor customary suits of solemn black, nor windy suspiration of force of breath, no, nor the fruitful river in the eye, nor the dejected haviour of the visage, together with all forms, moods, shapes of grief that can denote me truly. These indeed seem, for they are actions that a man might play. But I have that within which passeth show, these but the trappings and the suits of woe. It is sweet and commendable in your nature, Hamlet, to give these morning duties to your father, but you must know your father lost a father. That father lost, lost his, and the survivor bound in filial obligation for some term to do obsequ obsequious sorrow, but to persevere in obstinate condolement is a course of impious stubbornness. Tis unmanly grief, it shows a will most incorrect to heaven. A heart unfortified, a mind impatient, an understanding simple and unschooled. For what we know must be and is as common as any the most vulgar thing to sense, why should we in our peevish opposition take it to heart? Five, tis a fault to heaven, a fault against the dead, a fault to nature, to reason most absurd, whose common theme is death of fathers, and who still hath cried from the first course till he that died today. This must be so. We pray you, throw to earth this unprevailing woe, and think of us as of a father. For let the world take note, you are the most immediate to our throne, and with no less nobility of love than that which dearest father bears his son, do I impart toward you. For your intent in going back to school in Wittenberg, it is most retrograde to our desire, and we beseech you, bend you to remain here in the cheer and comfort of our eye our chiefest courtier, cousin, and our son. Let not thy mother lose her prayers, Hamlet. I pray thee, stay with us. Go not to Wittenberg. I shall, in all my best, obey you, madam. Why, tis a loving and fair reply. Be as ourself in Denmark. Madam, come. This gentle and unforced accord of Hamlet sits smiling to my heart. In grace whereof no jocund health that Denmark drinks today, but the great cannon to the clouds shall tell, and the king's rouse the heaven shall brew it again. 
re-speaking earthly thunder. Come away. Do, do, do. All but Hamlet exit. <sighs> that this too, too sullied flesh would melt, thaw, and resolve itself into a dew. Oh, that the everlasting had not fixed his cannon against self-slaughter. Oh, God. God. How weary, stale, flat, and unprofitable seem to me all the uses of this world. Fie on it. Ah, fie. Tis an unweeded garden that grows to seed. Things rank and gross in nature possess it merely. That it should come to this. But two months dead. Nay, nay, not so much, not two. So excellent a king that was to this. Hyperion to a satyr. So loving to my mother, that he might not beteem the winds of heaven visit her face too roughly. Heaven and earth must I remember. Why, she, she would hang on him as if increase of appetite had grown by what it fed on. And yet, hmm, within a month, let me not think on it. Frailty, thy name is woman. A little month, or else those shoes were old with which she followed my poor father's body like Niobe, all tears. Why, she, even she, oh God, a beast that wants discourse of reason would have mourned longer, married with my uncle, my father's brother, but no more like my father than I to Hercules within a month, ere yet the salt of most unrighteous tears had left the flashing in her gallant eyes she married. Oh, most wicked speed to post with such dexterity to incestuous sheets. It is not, nor it cannot come to good, but break my heart. For I must hold my tongue. Enter Horatio, Marcellus, and Barnardo. Hail, dear Lordship. I am glad to see you well. Horatio! Or do I forget myself? The same, my lord, and your poor, your poor servant ever. Sir, my good friend, I'll change that name with you. What make you from Wittenberg, Horatio? Marcellus? My good lord. My good lord. I'm very glad to see you. Uh, good even, sir. Uh, but in faith, what make you from Wittenberg? A truant disposition, good my lord. I would not hear your enemy say so, nor shall you do my ear that violence to make it truster of your own report against yourself. I know you are no truant. But what is your affair in Ilsener? We'll teach you to drink deep ere you depart. My lord, I came to see your father's funeral. I pray do not mock me, fellow student. I think it was to see my mother's wedding. Indeed, my lord, it followed hard upon. <laughs> thrift, uh, thrift, Horatio. The funeral baked meats did coldly furnish forth the marriage tables. Oh, would I had met my dearest foe in heaven, or ever I had seen that day, Horatio. Oh, my father. Methinks I see my father. Where, my lord? In my mind's eye, Horatio. I saw him once. He was a goodly king. Uh, he was a man. Take him for all in all. I shall not look upon his like again. My lord, I think... I saw him yesternight. So, so who? My lord, the king, your father. The king, my father? Season your admiration for a while with an attent ear, till I may deliver upon the witness of these gentlemen, 
this marvel to you. For God's love, let me hear. Two nights together had these gentlemen, Marcellus and Bernardo, on their watch in the dead waste and middle of the night, been thus encountered. A figure like your father, armed at point exactly, cap a pie, appears before them and with solemn march goes slow and stately by them. Thrice he walked by their oppressed and fear-surprised eyes within his truncheon's length, whilst they, distilled almost to jelly with an act of fear, stand dumb and speak not to him. This to me in dreadful secrecy in part they did, and I with them the third night kept the watch. Whereas they had delivered both in time form of the thing, each word made true and good, the apparition comes. I knew your father. These hands are not more like. But where was this? My lord, upon the platform where we watch. Did you not speak to it? My lord, I did, but answer made it none. Yet once methought it lifted up its head and did address, address itself to motion, like as it would speak. But even then, the morning cock crew loud, and at the sound it shrunk in haste away and vanished from our sight. Tis very strange. As I do live, my honored lord, tis true. And we did think it writ down in our duty to let you know of it. Indeed, sirs. But this troubles me. Hath you the watch tonight? We do, my lord. Armed, you say? Armed, Armed my, lord. my lord. From lord. top to toe? My lord, from head to foot. <gasps> then saw you not his face? Oh, yes, my lord. He wore his beaver up. What? Uh, looked he f frowningly? A, a countenance more in sorrow than anger. Pale or, or red? Nay, very pale. And fixed his eyes upon you? Most constantly. Ah, oh, would I'd been there. It would have much amazed you. Very like. <laughs> Stayed it long. While one with moderate haste might tell a hundred. Longer, longer. Well, Not when I thought. His beard uh, was grizzled, no? It was, as I have seen it in his life, a sable, silvered. <laughs> I will watch tonight. Uh, perchance it will come again. I warrant it will. If it assume my noble father's person, I'll speak to it, though hell itself should gape and hold me, bid me hold my peace. I pray you all, if you have hitherto concealed this sight, let it be tenable in your silence still. And whatsoever else shall hap tonight, give it an understanding, but no tongue. I will requite your loves. So, fare you well. Upon the platform, twixt eleven and twelve, I'll visit you. Our duty yes, to your honour. Honor. Your loves as mine to you. My father's spirit in arms. All is not well. I doubt some foul play. Would the night were come, till then sit still my soul, foul deeds will rise, oh, all the world, all the earth will whelm them to men's eyes. Scene three, enter Laertes and Ophelia, his sister. <sighs> my necessaries are embarked, farewell, and sister. As the winds give benefit and convey his assistant, uh, do not sleep, but let me hear from you. Betty, we've lost your voice. Let me hear from you, Ophelia. Ah. Do you doubt that? For uh, Hamlet he... and the oh. trifling of his favor, hold it a fashion and a toy in blood, a Don't violet be... in the youth of primy nature. Ah, uh, forward, not permanent, sweet, not lasting, 
the perfume and suppliance of a minute. No more. No more, but so? Think it no more. For nature, crescent, does not grow alone, infuse and bulk, but as this temple waxes, the inward service of the mind and soul grows wide withal. Perhaps <laughs> he loves you now, and now no soil nor cottle bo doth besmirch the virtue of his will, but you must fear his greatness weighed, his will is not his own, for he himself is subject to his birth. He may not, as unvalued persons do, carve for himself, for on his choice depends the safety and the health of this whole state, and therefore must his choice be circumscribed unto the voice and yielding of that body whereof he is the head. Then, if he says he loves you, it fits your wisdom so far to believe it, as he in his particular act and place may give his saying deed, which is no further than the main voice of Denmark goes with all, then weigh what loss your honor may sustain. If with too credent ear your, you list his song or lose your heart or your chaste treasure open to his unmastered importunity, Fear it, Ophelia, fear it, my dear sister, and keep you in the rear of your affection, out of the shot and danger of desire. The cheriest maid is prodigal enough if she unmask her beauty to the moon. Virtue itself scapes not calumnious strokes. The canker galls the infants of the spring too oft before their buttons be disclosed. And in the morn and liquid dew of youth, contagious blastments are most imminent. Be wary then, but best safety lies in fear. <laughs> to itself rebels, though none else near. I shall the effect of this good lesson keep as watchman <laughs> to my heart. But good, my brother, do not, as some ungracious pastors do, show me the steep and thorny way to heaven, whiles like a puffed and reckless libertine, himself the primrose path of dalliance treads, and wrecks not his own reed. Oh, fear me not. Enter Polonius. Uh, I stay too long, but here my father comes. A double blessing is a double grace. Occasion smiles upon a second leave. Dirt, here, Laertes, aboard, aboard, for shame. The wind sits on the shoulder of your sail, and you are stay for there. I bless you with thee, and these few precepts in my memory, look thou character, give thy thoughts no tongue, nor any unportioned thought his act. Be thou familiar, but by no means vulgar. Hmm? Those friends thou hast, and they're Adoption try to grapple them unto thy soul and hoops of steel, but do not dull thy palm with entertainment of each new hatched unfledged courage. Beware of entrance to a quarrel, but be in. There is that the pose may beware of thee. Give every man thy ear, but few thy voice. Take each man, said sir, but reserve thy judgment. Hmm? Costly, thy habit, as thy purse can buy, but not expressed in fancy. The rich, they not gaudy, for the apparel oft proclaims the man. And they in France, of the best rank and station, uh, are of a most select and generous chief in that. And neither a borrower nor a lender be, for loan oft loses both itself and friend. Borrowing dull that the age of husbandry, this above all to thine own self be true, and it must follow as at night of the day thou canst not be able to false to any man. Farewell, my blessing season this in thee. Hmm? Most humbly do I take my leave, my lord. Mm, the time invest you go, your servants tend. Farewell, Ophelia, and remember well what I have said to you. Tis in my memory locked, and you yourself shall keep the key of it. Farewell. Laertes exits. What is it, Ophelia, he hath said to you? 
so please you, something touching the Lord Hamlet. Mary will be thought, tis told he hath very oft of late given private time to you, and you yourself have all of your audience been most free and bounteous. If it be so, as so it is put on me, and that in the way of caution, I must tell you, you do not understand yourself so clearly as it behooves my daughter and your honour <clears throat> what is between you. Give me up the truth. He hath, my lord, of late made many tenders of his affection to me. Affection, poor. You speak like a green girl, and sifted in such perilous circumstance. Do you believe his tenders, as you call them? I do not know, my lord, what I should think of them. Mm, I should Mary, think. I will teach you. Think yourself a baby that you have ten such tenders of true pay, which are not sterling. Tend yourself more dearly. Or, not to crack the wind of the poor phrase, running it thus. You'll tender me a fool. My lord, he hath importuned me with love in honourable fashion. Ay, <laughs> fashion. You may call it, go to, go to. And hath given countenance to his speech, my lord, with almost all the holy vows of heaven. Ay, springs to catch woodcocks. I do know. When the blood burns, our prodigal to soul lends the tongue vows. These blazes, daughter, give more light than eat, extinct in both, even in their promise as it is a making. You must not take for fire. From this time, be something scanter of your maiden presence. Set your entreatments at a high rate. A little command to parley. For Lord Hamlet believes so much in him that he is young. <laughs> With a larger tether may he walk than may be given you. In fewer feel you do not believe his vows, for they are brokers. Not that that die, which their investments show, but mere imperators of unholy suits, breathing like sanctified and pious boards, and better to beguile. <laughs> this is for all. I will not in plain terms from this time forth have you so slander any moment leisure as to give words or talk to the Lord Hamlet. Look to it, I charge you. Come your ways. I shall obey, my lord. The exit. Mm. Scene four. Enter Hamlet, Horatio, and Marcellus. Oh, the air bites shrewdly. It is very cold. It is a nipping and an eager air. <clears throat> what hour now? I think it lacks of 12. No, it is struck. Uh, indeed. I heard it not. If then draws near the season wherein the spirit held his want to walk. Do, do, do. What does this mean, my lord? Ah, the king doth wake tonight <clears throat> and takes his rouse, keeps wassail, and the swaggering upspring reels. And as he ha, drains his drafts of Rhenish down, the kettle drum and trumpet thus bray out the triumph of his pledge. Is it a custom? Aye, aye, Mary is. <laughs> but to my mind, though I am native here and to the manor born, it is a custom more honoured in the <coughs> breach than the observance. This heavy-headed revel east and west makes us traduced and taxed of other nations. They clap us drunkards and with swinish phrase soil our addition, and indeed it takes from our achievements, though performed at height, the pith and marrow of our attribute. So oft it chances in particular men that for some vicious mole of nature in them, as in their birth wherein they are not guilty, since nature cannot choose his origin, or by the or growth of some complexion oft breaking down the pales and forts of reason or by some habit that too much or leavens the form of plausive manners that these men carrying i say the stamp of one defect being nature's livery or fortune's star <laughs> his virtues else be they as pure as grace, as infinite as man may undergo, shall in the general censure take 
corruption from that particular fault. The dram of evil doth all the noble substance of a doubt to his own scandal. Enter ghost. Look, my lord, it comes. Angels and ministers of grace defend us. Be thou a spirit of health or a goblin damned. Bring with thee airs from heaven or blasts from hell. Be thy intense, wicked or charitable. Thou comest in such questionable shape that I will speak to thee. I'll call thee Hamlet, King, Father, Royal Dane. Oh, answer me. Let me not burst in ignorance, but tell why thy canonized bones, hearsed in death, have burst their sediments. Why, the, the sepulchre wherein we saw thee quietly interred hath oped his ponderous and marble jaws to cast thee up again. What may this mean that thou, dead course, again in complete steel, revisits thus the glimpses of the moon, making night hideous, and we, fools of nature, so horridly to shake our disposition with thoughts beyond the reaches of our souls? Say, why is this? Wherefore? What should we do? Ghost beckons. It beckons you to go away with it, as if it, it some impartment did desire to you alone. Look with what courteous action it waves you to a more removed ground. No, by no means should you go with it. It will not speak. Then I will follow it. Do not, my lord. Why, why, what should the fear? I do not set my life at a pin's fee. And for my soul, what can it do to that? Being a thing immortal as itself. It weighs me forth again. I'll follow it. What if it tempt you toward the flood, my lord? Or to the dreadful summit of the cliff that beetles over his base into the sea? And there assume some other horrible form which might deprive you or your sovereignty of reason and draw you into madness. Think of it. The very place puts toys of desperation without more motive into every brain that looks like so many fathoms to the sea and hears it roar beneath. It waves me still. Go on, I'll follow thee. You shall not go, my lord. They Hold on, my hands. Be ruled, you shall not go. My fate cries out and makes each petty art here in this body as hardy as the Nemean lion's nerve. Still, I'm called. Unhand me, gentlemen. By heaven, I'll make a ghost of him that lets me. I say, away, away, go on. I'll follow thee. Ghost and Hamlet exit. He waxes desperate with imagination. Let's follow. Tis not fit thus to obey him. Have after. To what issue will this come? Something is wrong in the state of Denmark. Heaven will direct it. Nay, let's follow him. They exit. Scene five. Enter Ghost and Hamlet. Whither wilt thou lead me? Speak. I'll go no further. Mark me. I will. By hours almost come when I to sulphurous and tormenting flames must render up myself. Alas, poor ghost. Pity me not, but lend thy serious hearing to what I shall unfold. Speak, I am bound to hear. So art thou to revenge when thou shalt hear. What? I am thy father's spirit doomed for a certain time to walk the night and for day confined to fast in fires till the foul crimes done in my days of nature are burned and purged away. But that I am forbid to tell the secrets of my prison house, I could a tale unfold whose lightest word would harrow up thy soul, freeze thy young blood, make 
my two eyes like stars start from this. He is. I knotted and combined locks to part and each particular hair to stand and end my quills upon the fretful porcupine. That this eternal blazon must not be to ears of flesh and blood. List, list, oh list, if ever thou didst thy dear father love. Oh God! Revenge this foul and most unnatural murder. Murder? Murder most foul as in the best it is. For this most foul, strange and unnatural. Haste me to know it, that I with wings as swift as meditation or the thoughts of love may sweep to my revenge. I find thee apt, and duller should thou be than the fat weed that roots itself in the ease on leaf wharf. Wouldst thou not stir in this? Now Hamlet, let here. Tis given out that sleeping in my orchard a serpent stung me. So the whole ear of Denmark is by forged process of my death rankly abused. But now, thou noble youth, know thy noble youth, the serpent that did sting thy father's life, thou wears his crown. Oh, my prophetic soul! My Die. uncle! Guy, that incestuous, that adulterous beast with witchcraft of his wits, with traitorous gifts of wicked wit and gifts that have the power so to seduce, one to his shameful lust, the will of my most seeming virtuous queen. Oh, Hamlet, what a falling off was there for me, whose love was that of dignity, that it went hand in hand, even with the vow I made to her in marriage, and to decline upon a wretch whose natural gifts were poor to those of mine. But virtue, as it never will be moved, who lewdness caught it in a shape of heaven, so lust, through a radiant angel linked, will sate itself in a celestial bed and prey on. Garbage, but stop. Methinks I sent the morning air. Brief, let me be. Sleeping within my orchard, my custom always of the afternoon. Upon my secure hour, thy uncle stole with juice of cursed hermana in a vial, and in the pouches of mine ears did pour the leprous distillment. What effect holds such an amnesty with blood of man that switched as quicksilver it courses through the natural gates and alleys of the body, and with a sudden vigor it doth toss it and curd like eager droppings into milk, the thin and wholesome blood. So did it mine. At <laughs> the most instant, tetter barked about most lazulite with violent, loathsome crust all my smooth body. Thus was I sleeping by a brother's hand of life, of crown, of queen, at once dispatched, cut off even the blossoms of my sin, unhoused, disappointed, unannailed, no reckoning made, but sent to my account with all the imperfections of my head. Oh, horrible. Oh, horrible, most horrible. If thou hast nature in thee, hear me, hear it, bear it not. Let it not thy royal bed of Denmark be a couch for luxury and damned incest. But whomsoever thou pursuest in this act, taint not thy mind, nor let thy soul contrive upon thy mother, Lord. Leave her to heaven and to those thorns that in her bosom lodge. Prick and sting her fairly well at once. The glowworm shows the matin to be near. Gins to pale is ineffectual fire. Adieu, adieu, adieu. Remember me. Ghost exits. Oh. <sighs>
Oh, you host of heaven! Oh, earth! What else? And shall I couple hell? Oh, fie! Hold, hold my heart! And you, my sinews, grow not instant old, but bear me stiffly up. Remember thee? I, the hell poor ghost, while memory holds a seat in this distracted globe. Remember thee? Hey, hey, from the table of my memory, I'll wipe away all trivial fond records, all sores of books, all forms, all precious past that youth and observation copied there. And thy commandment, all alone shall live within the book and volume of my brain, unmixed with baser matter. Yes, by heaven, O oh, most pernicious woman, O oh, villain, villain, smiling, damned villain. My tables, meet it is, I set it down, that one may smile and smile and be a villain. At least, I am sure it may be so in Denmark. So, uncle, there you are. Now to my word, it is adieu, adieu, remember me. I have sworn it. Enter Horatio and Marcellus. My lord, my lord. Lord Hamlet, heaven secure him. So be it. Hello, ho, ho, my lord. Ilio, ho, boy, hey, come, bird, come. How is it, my noble lord? What news, my lord? Oh, wonderful. Good, my lord. Tell it. Oh, no, you will reveal it. Not I, my lord, by heaven. Nor I, my lord. How say you then? Would heart of man once think it? But you'll be secret? Aye, by heaven, my lord. There's never a villain dwelling in all of Denmark, but he's an arrant knave. There needs no ghost, my lord, come from the grave to tell us this. Oh. Well, uh, right, you are in the right. And so, without more circumstance at all, I, I hold it fit that we shake hands and part. Uh, you, as your business and desire shall point you, for every man hath business and desire, such as it is, uh, and I, uh, for my poor part, I will go to pray. These are but wild and whirling words, my lord. I, I am sorry they offend you, heartily. Yes, faith, heartily. There's no offence, my lord. Yes, by St. Patrick, but there is a ratio, and much offence too. Touching this vision here, it is an honest ghost, that let me tell you. For your desire to know what is between us, or master it as you may. And now, good friends, as you are, friends, Scholars and soldiers, give me one poor request. What is it, my lord? We will. Never make known what you have seen tonight. My lord, my lord we, we will not. not. Nay, but swear it. In faith, my lord, not I. Nor I, my lord, in faith. Upon my sword. We have sworn, my lord, already. Indeed, upon my sword, indeed. Swear! Ha ha, boy, say, 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 art thou there, Troopany? Come on, you hear this fellow in the cellarage, consent to swear. Propose the oath, my lord. Never to speak of this that you have seen. Swear by my sword. Well, hic et ubic, ha, then we'll shift our ground. Come hither, gentlemen. 
and lay your hands upon my sword. Swear by my sword never to speak of this that you have heard. Swear by his sword. Oh, well said, old mole. Canst work in the earth so fast? A worthy pioneer. Once more, remove, good friends. Oh, day and night. But this is wondrous strange. <laughs> and therefore, as a stranger, give it welcome. There are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamt of in your philosophy. But come, come, here as before, never so help you mercy. How strange or odd some air I bear myself, as I perchance hereafter shall think meet to put an antic disposition on, that you at times seeing me never shall with arms encumbered thus, or this head shake, or by uh, pronouncing of some doubtful phrase as, um, well, we know, or, hey, we could if we would, or if we list to speak, or if there be, and if there might, or some such ambiguous giving out, to note that you know aught of me, this do swear, so grace and mercy at your most help need you. Where? Rest, rest, perturbed spirit. So, gentlemen, with all my love, I do commend me to you. And what so poor a man as Hamlet is, may do to express his love and friending to you, God willing, shall not lack. Let us go in together and still your fingers on your lips, I pray. Time is out of joint. Oh, cursed spite that ever I was born to set it right. Nay, come, let's go together. Voila. End of Act One. Well, we got through that a little bit faster than I 